Starship's next major milestones are quietly taking shape across SpaceX's facilities. Ship 39 looks staged for a new structural test, while Booster 19 remains deep in critical outfitting, confirmed by fresh inside footage from Starbase. Raptor V3 had another off-nominal event at McGregor, and Florida's LC-39A tower just hit a major upgrade milestone. Let's break it all down. Ship 39, the Flight 12 upper stage, recently had its scaffolding removed, marking the end of roughly two weeks of heat shield work focused near the nose cone. As explained in the previous episode, the activity appears focused on tile retention hardware, aimed at improving hold down strength and reducing tile loss risk during atmospheric re-entry. Several pin interface points now show a white fill material, likely a sealant or high-temperature stabilizing compound used to lock down the pin region and limit hot gas intrusion or tile micro-motion. Notably, the modification appears limited to one side of the nose cone, consistent with SpaceX's practice of flight testing upgrades on a small section first. If it performs well, Ship 40 may receive the same retention upgrade more broadly. The full technical breakdown of this heat shield work is covered in the previous episode. Ship 39 is currently connected to a bridge crane and appears to be preparing for a lift, either for repositioning into an adjacent work cell or for rollout to Massey's. Supporting that, the ship's static fire and transport stand was moved to the production site early Wednesday, indicating ground hardware is being staged for the vehicle's transport and testing. However, Ship 39 still has no Raptor engines installed, so it is not ready for static fire. It also cannot undergo a cryo-proof test because the main cryo-test stand has already returned to Massey's with Test Tank 18, which will be covered later in this episode. If Ship 39 rolls out soon, it is therefore most likely headed to Massey's for testing at the new structure near the static fire area. That setup is most likely intended for structural validation of the landing pin interface under catch-like loads. The landing pins beneath the forward flaps carry the primary load path during a tower catch transferring vehicle weight into the chopsticks while absorbing dynamic loads from alignment offsets and transient contact forces. Simply put, if this interface deforms, cracks, or tears out, the catch fails, so validating it on the ground is critical. The detailed breakdown of this test setup and why it strongly points to landing pin load testing was covered in the previous episode linked below, so I'll keep it brief here. On the super heavy side, Booster 19 is fully stacked, and teams are completing the final rounds of electrical integration, hydraulic hookups, and plumbing work ahead of its cryogenic proof testing. On January 12th, Pete Hegseth, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, visited Starbase during his Arsenal of Freedom tour aimed at revitalizing America's manufacturing workforce, meeting SpaceX teams and leadership, including Elon Musk. Footage from the visit briefly showed Booster 19 inside the mega bay and it's clear the booster is still in heavy outfitting rather than rollout ready, suggesting more assembly and integration remain before cryotesting. While preparations for the first Block 3 Starship launch continue, SpaceX is running an aggressive parallel program at Massey's, where Block 3 ship and booster test tanks are undergoing intensive cryogenic validation. Early Monday morning, Test Tank 18, also referred to as Ship 39.1, returned to Massey's for its second round of testing. This tank, built specifically to validate multiple Block 3 structural and interface upgrades, previously completed three cryogenic proof tests in December during its first campaign. After that initial testing, both the tank and its cryogenic test stand were moved back to the production site. Teams spent the next couple of weeks reinforcing and upgrading the stand, effectively evolving it from a more version 2 class structure into a much stronger version 3 class test stand capable of handling higher loads and more flight representative conditions. The test tank itself also received upgrades, with the most visible change being the addition of a docking port enclosure on its exterior, matching the type of docking architecture SpaceX is expected to use for ship-to-ship -ship docking and orbital propellant transfer. Alongside that docking enclosure, the tank also received a set of structural reinforcements and interface refinements. With these upgrades complete, Test Tank 18 is now positioned to begin its second cryo series atop the upgraded test stand. Only after that campaign finishes and the cryo stand is freed up will Ship 39 begin its own cryogenic testing, potentially incorporating minor design tweaks and fixes informed by Test Tank 18's data. Separately, in addition to the Test Tank 18, Block 3 booster test tanks 17 and 19 are also undergoing testing at Massey's. Those were already covered in detail in earlier episodes. Links are in the description. 
Meanwhile, at SpaceX's McGregor Test Facility, a Raptor V3 engine experienced another anomaly, now the third publicly documented energetic event tied to this next-generation variant. The engine was undergoing validation firing on a vertical test stand, essentially qualification-style testing to confirm performance, stability margins, and readiness for vehicle integration. In footage captured by NASA spaceflight, ignition appears nominal, but about five seconds into the burn, a thick plume of black smoke rose from the flame trench. Crucially, there was no visible detonation or test stand destruction. The firing continued for roughly 15 seconds after the smoke appeared, followed by what sounded like a controlled shutdown, suggesting a contained anomaly and likely an early abort rather than catastrophic failure. In methane engines, black smoke often indicates soot formation, typically linked to fuel-rich operation, local burn-through, or combustion outside the intended flow path, such as a line or component leak, or hot gas interacting with insulation and nearby materials. The fact that the engine kept firing after the smoke appeared suggests this wasn't an immediate structural rupture and may have triggered an automated abort. Events like this can resemble some in-flight Starship engine shutdowns, where engines drop offline without an explosion due to sensor limit trips, propellant feed transients, or turbo machinery and combustion instability. This incident also appears less violent than the earlier Raptor V3 anomalies in May and November last year, where visuals more strongly suggested explosive failure. Regardless, these test anomalies generate dense telemetry that engineers use to identify weak modes and harden the design. Finally, Starship pad development at Kennedy Space Center made major progress this week. The first major piece of the ship quick disconnect arm was installed on the launch tower on Tuesday, and teams are now connecting it into the tower's electrical, plumbing, and pneumatic systems to support propellant transfer, plus electrical and data continuity. Once fully integrated, the second section, housing the actual ship QD mechanism, will be mounted to the installed structure. In parallel, booster quick disconnect hood components are being delivered to LC-39A, indicating that the BQD portion of the launch mount work is nearing completion. With these milestones moving quickly, SpaceX appears aligned with its target for a first Starship launch from Kennedy by year-end, pending regulatory approvals and overall test readiness. Elon Musk recently claimed that within about three years, Starship could be launching more than once per hour, and later added it might take four years but not more than that. Taken literally, that implies close to 10,000 launches per year, essentially pushing Starship toward an aviation-like flight rate. For perspective, Starship's highest cadence so far is just five launches last year, following four the year before and two the year before that. So while the long-term vision matches SpaceX's rapid reusability philosophy, hourly launches would require far more than reusable vehicles. It demands airline-style turnaround, mass Raptor production, non-stop pad availability, streamlined range safety, and a massive flight demand. It's an ambitious target and a clear signal of where SpaceX wants to take Starship, but the gap from today's reality is still enormous. Now, let's discuss the latest updates from the world of science and technology. In a major setback, India's trusted workhorse rocket, the Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle, PSLV, veered off course during its latest mission, marking the second consecutive failure. The PSLV C-62 mission lifted off on January 12th from Satish Dhawan Space Center on India's southeastern coast, carrying EOS N1, a hyperspectral Earth observation satellite for military intelligence, along with 15 international co-passengers and Indian tech demos. The launch initially proceeded normally. The first stage, driven by a large solid motor and two strap-on boosters, performed as planned and separated cleanly at about 112 seconds. The second stage then fired its VCAS liquid engine, and performance remained nominal through burnout, setting up third-stage ignition near 215 kilometers altitude. The third stage, a solid motor using hydroxyl-terminated polybutadiene propellant and producing about 250 kilonewtons thrust, appeared stable and burned for its expected 125 seconds, providing the final push toward orbital velocity. However, near the end of the burn, telemetry showed abnormal roll rate disturbances, triggering a sudden trajectory deviation that sent the rocket into an uncontrolled tumble. The vehicle did not regain control, as onboard video confirmed the vehicle's rapid spin and loss of attitude control. After the third stage anomaly, the fourth stage separated at around 494 seconds and ignited shortly afterward, but the tumbling stack could only reach a suborbital trajectory, 
it failed to achieve the altitude and velocity needed for orbit insertion and ultimately re-entered over the Indian Ocean, with all payloads lost. However, a surprising update emerged afterward. Spanish startup Orbital Paradigm reported that its 25-kilogram Kestrel initial demonstrator re-entry capsule, KID, while still coupled with the upper stage, survived re-entry, switched on key systems, remained operational, and transmitted 190 seconds of data, logging peak loads near 28G and internal temperature telemetry. Designed for controlled re-entry and South Pacific splashdown testing, it appears to have endured extreme heating and deceleration that would destroy most experimental payloads, meaning the core re-entry demonstration still produced valuable results despite the failed launch. The company is reconstructing the trajectory and will release a full report soon. ISRO said the vehicle performed as expected until the final phase of third stage operation, when roll instability and path deviation began. Likely causes include a nozzle malfunction, structural failure, or other solid motor fault. This is the second PSLV failure in a row, both tied to third stage issues. The previous failure in May last year involved a drop in third stage chamber pressure, leading to the loss of EOS-09, a radar imaging satellite vital for all weather surveillance. Two similar failures back to back now demand a deep investigation especially into solid motor manufacturing quality, structural integrity, and nozzle systems, with some experts calling for temporary grounding until the root cause is confirmed. Despite the setbacks, PSLV's overall record remains strong. 63 launches since 1993, with 58 full successes, for a success rate of about 92%. These back-to-back -back failures are serious, but they're solvable engineering problems. NASA's SpaceX Crew-11 astronauts splashed down safely off the coast of California early Thursday, ending a space station mission that was cut short by a medical emergency. Crew-11 was launched in August last year from Kennedy Space Center, flying to the International Space Station aboard Crew Dragon Endeavor. The mission carried four astronauts, two from NASA, one from JAXA, and one Russian cosmonaut, for what was expected to be a standard long-duration stay. Over their more than five-month stay in orbit, the crew completed over 140 science experiments, along with routine station maintenance and technology demonstration. Early this month, NASA was preparing for a spacewalk scheduled for January 8th with astronauts Zena Cardman and Mike Finke set to install external hardware to support future installation of upgraded rollout solar arrays, a key step in increasing the ISS's power capacity. However, on January 7th, an undisclosed Crew-11 astronaut developed a medical concern, prompting NASA to cancel the spacewalk immediately. NASA said the astronaut's condition was stable and chose an early return as a precaution to enable Earth-based medical care, the first time NASA has shortened a spaceflight due to a medical issue. On January 12th, Finke handed over ISS command to cosmonaut Sergei Kudsverchkov, and the Crew-11 astronauts began return procedures. On January 14th, they suited up, boarded Endeavour, closed the hatch, and undocked from the station. After roughly 10 hours in free flight, Dragon performed its de-orbit burn, re-entered Earth's atmosphere, deployed parachutes for a controlled descent, and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean off California. Recovery teams aboard SpaceX's vessel MV Shannon approached the capsule, secured it, and lifted it onto the deck. After hatch opening, the crew exited with assistance onto stretchers a standard process to help astronauts readjust to gravity while smiling and waving, indicating they were in good spirits. All four appeared healthy with no visible signs of distress. Following initial medical checks on board, they were flown by helicopter to a local hospital for further evaluations. The astronaut who experienced symptoms will undergo additional focused examinations and treatment as needed. Looking ahead, the replacement mission, SpaceX Crew-12, is currently targeted to launch no earlier than February 15th, carrying two NASA astronauts, one ESA astronaut, and a Russian cosmonaut. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.